but, but Good evening. Please. Our last session is Introduction to Robert Hotek Lecture by Maria Pereira. Robert Hotek Lecture, Remaining Trade, Shifts and Paradigm by Professor Paridi Alai. Please. Oh, buenas tardes. I'm going to speak in Spanish. Uh, well, good afternoon. I'm really happy that I was asked to introduce my dear friend Paride Alay's lecture and also being there for the lecture. Please, thank you very much for asking me that. And I wanted also to thank, muchas gracias, eh, la Universidad del Externado y la Universidad de Rosales eh, por haber puesto sus eh, instalaciones y todo su cariño y todo su esfuerzo en que sea una conferencia tan bien organizada, tan entusiasta. ¿no? Y desde el punto de vista de la OMC les doy muchas las gracias. ¿no? I'm looking at the representative from the university and thank them because it was a really well organized university. ¿eh? And, a, and as a humble member from the executive committee, eh, como un miembro de la, del comité ejecutivo de la de, de CIEN, les damos las gracias. Okay. So I'm going to start. Okay. I know you are very tired, but this is like the cake of today. Eh? And uh, it is too. I get like this, but otherwise I'm not going to be able to read. So we actually gather here today uh, to honor okay, the memory of an eminent scholar, Professor Robert Hudek, 
who for more than three decades, he was instrumental in shaping what we know now as international economic law and actually serve as an inspiration to many students. I was a student at the time and uh, scholars and, and decision makers. Okay. So Professor Hudek was a pioneer, an innovative thinker. Even nowadays we read what he wrote three decades ago and it's just amazing how he came up with those uh, writings, how innovative, how clever. Um, and uh, actually I was researching to, for, for introducing this, this lecture and I was quite uh, impressed how other colleagues will talk about him. Okay? Professor Jackson, the late Professor Jackson, I did have the pleasure to meet him and we, he's also sorely missed. He actually described him as a consummate legal professional with big words, but the one, the, the quote, if you allow me, that uh, really touched me, how another colleague uh, described him is Professor uh, Steve Charnowitz. that said that he, Bob was a spirited, witty and assuming, kind and honest man who enjoyed having his ideas contested by others and was willing to spend time to help colleagues and students think through their ideas like our speaker today. So it's just fantastic that they ask Fadi de Alaya to present you know, under the lecture dedicated to Robert Hood. So, um, You know, for those of you who do not know uh, Professor Alai, for me is my dear friend that I admire. Many, um, as a female uh, professor in international economic law, has been an example to follow you. But I guess all of you know her. Uh, so that her CV, she sent me the, the brief bio and it was just enormous, but I would like to highlight some um, parts of her academic career and her personality. So Professor Alaya is a very renowned professor in international economic law. Say no, but yes, but it is yes. She's a professor in the American University, Washington College of Law. And among the, her jobs or titles, she's actually director um, of, uh, the, uh, of, uh, of the International and Comparative Legal Studies, uh, and also director of the Hubert Humphrey Fellowship Program. Uh, she helps a lot of people with that uh, fellowship program. And she was previously also a member of the executive committee of the uh, of CEO. Okay? And uh, as I was saying, for me, the parallelism with uh, Professor Hudek is that she's an inspiration for many students. And I have had the privilege of uh, having supervised former students of Paride as an intern at the Legal Affairs Division of the WTO. And uh, I could see how she nurtures them and how she cares for them and, and how good you train them because they were some of the best from the interns we have. Some of them, they are our colleagues now. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you think. So she's a dedicated academic and she has significantly contributed to the literature on free trade history, WTO transparency obligations, and the universalization of administrative state through the multilateral trading system, among other topics. Now she has a great uh, body of uh, work, okay? And her work actually reflects a profound understanding of the intricate relationship between law and international trade, and is characterized for me, as I see from a quest for intellectual rigor uh, and social relevance, because you do look a lot of social issues. So today, Professor Alayan is going to share with us uh, her insights on a topic of relevance, reimagining trade, how we do that, eh? and shift in paradigms. Did I pronounce it properly? Had difficulty with that word, okay, paradigms. So she will guide us actually, she's gonna focus on the history of the United States, and in particular the history of trade and the approach to trade by the United States. And then he has uh, is going to make some um, comments on China. So everybody's gonna be interested about that, okay? And you see, I was thinking, imagining trade, 
shifting paradigms. You know, that's something difficult to look at, but it's something that is happening now in the difficult uh, geopolitical situation we're going through. And another parallelism with Professor Hudek, because himself was known uh, for his capacity to navigate and comprehend the ships in the situation and uh, all his work, actually looking at how you go from not having the gas, the gas and then the WTO um, led us to what we have now, as I said before, the current state of international trade law. I don't think he will be very happy if you see what's happening with the WTO now, but perhaps we can all come together with some ideas how to save uh, my home, um, the WTO. So today we are privileged to hear Professor Lai uh, explore these uh, themes in her lecture. And without further ado, I just said too many nonsense, it's my absolute honor to welcome Professor Padide Alai to the podium. We are all ears, Padide. Welcome. I want to thank you all for staying around. It's been a long day, and I'm going to try not to bore you and, uh, and make it. Uh, make you fall asleep. I want to thank Maria for your friendship and your professionalism. The lawyers at WTO have always been amazing and it's been a great training for a lot of our, our students. I want to thank Peter Van der Bosch. I don't know where Peter is. Thank you for inviting me uh, to deliver this lecture. It's a great honor. It's also good, back, good to be back in Bogota. I want to thank uh, all the organizers, Externado uh, and all the executive committee members I uh, was with um, Gabriel. We put together the SEAL conference in 2017 in Washington, and it's a hell of a lot of work. So I have a lot of sympathy for, for all those who are going to celebrate after the last day tomorrow. Um, it, takes, it, ta it takes a village to make this happen. Um, I also have a soft spot on CL in my heart because I was there, a chair of the International Economic Law Group, of American Society of International Law, when we a bunch of us got together and we were talking after the Grotius lecture, which we also sponsor, about how at that time, ASIL wasn't really focusing on international economic law. And maybe there should be an in, 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 in umbrella international organization. And I know Meredith was there, Colin Picker and Andrew Lang, we're not here now today. Um, and then later on, we were having some issues with ASIL over the finances. I think, Kat, you may remember this. Uh, uh, the money for the interest groups, they were reshuffling them. So we were losing our money as well. At any rate, um, we decided uh, there was a conference at Bretton Woods when the idea came to create this Society of International Economic Law and the rest is history. We are so happy. Uh, the General Council of American University wouldn't agree to have it incorporated in Washington. So it ended up getting incorporated in London. So maybe that's best for the best that it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, it's a, it's a, Europe. it's, it's a British and not American organization. Um, when Peter asked me to deliver a keynote, I was trying to figure out, of course, what to say. There's tremendous amount of uncertainty in the world. I believe everyone knows that there's a seismic shift going on in international economic relations. Not only is the world moving towards a multipolar world, the advent of artificial intelligence will significantly change our world in ways we cannot even imagine today. Just as we could not before the internet imagine a world with the internet, and I'm, I, I'm old enough to remember a world without the internet, many argue that the AI revolution is even more profound, and I would have to probably agree. At the same time, I was coming from Washington DC and the United States, and I thought perhaps I should concentrate on the role of the United States and how it is affecting the rest of the world. And of course, anytime you think about the United States, you think about China because that's what everybody talks about in Washington, D.C., or at least if they don't talk about it, it's there. So I um, approached it the way I always approach things. And this is, I put myself in it. I'm an immigrant to the United States. I arrived there as a teenager on a Khomeini scholarship is what I call it. It's a one-way scholarship. I was thrown out of the country, couldn't go back. Um, 40, 40 years ago, I mean, I love the United States because it gave me a place to escape to. Um, we celebrated this year, 40 year anniversary of the execution of my friends um, by the Islamic Republic. So I was very much aware of, uh, <laughs> of, of how much the United States has given to me. 
But once I started, I was Harvard Law School six years after I immigrated, I realized that law was very much a cultural construct. And there's so much I didn't understand about why my classmates were so, uh, I actually didn't know what the word litigation meant. I had never heard it before. Nobody used the word litigation around me. So I went to Mort Horowitz, who is a legal historian at Harvard, and said, I want to become your research assistant and learn about legal history. And so for me, that was the way I approached this talking. Let's understand, I mean, I'm here in Bogota, let's understand Americans and how did it all come about? We think that um, Donald Trump is an aberration. He's not, I'm here to tell you. Um, and so if you look at the history of the United States, it's actually quite interesting. And I thought I would talk about that from its beginning to the present, I'll be brief. And then I will make a few observations about China. I'm not a historian. I definitely am not a Chinese historian. But there are some observations that I would like to make. And then the topic has been reimagining, but you can't reimagine without understanding these two players. As every an ambassador told me in, in Geneva, if only these two could figure out their problems, then the rest of us could actually get on with it. Um, the United States was created by for and by trade. Overseas trade with Britain was an integral part of the North American colonies and an important driving force for the struggle for independence. From the beginning, the North American colonies were divided into different, different economic regions. And these regions, although changing, kept still salients today. It was the New England at that time, shipping related activities, shipbuilding, shipping services, uh, fishing and whaling, New York and Pennsylvania, commerce, small and craft production, and ironworks, and some small farms. And the South then, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, tobacco. And South Carolina, Georgia, rice and indigo, relying on slave labor with large farms. Important to note that the South had the largest per capita of export at the beginning, and they were, and maybe to this day they are, are the most vocal supporters of free trade in the United States, primarily because they relied on slave trade. Revolution was due to British restrictions on commerce. First was the Navigation Acts, which the British Parliament required all colonial trades to be channeled through Britain and its territories in the West Indies. This meant increased costs and less money for the tobacco planters and other ex colonial exporters. Uh, we then have the Sugar Act of the British, the Stamp Act, and of course the famous Tea Act of 1773, which was aimed at bailing out the East India Company and then we have the Boston Tea Party and the dumping of 342 chests of, tea, chests of tea in the sea. The first movement really of independence was by 200 merchants of New York that decided to stop trading and importing from Great Britain in 1766. It was the first Continental Congress that called for the non-importation of all goods from Great Britain. And it was the second Continental Congress in April 1776 that stated, quote, the colonies were no longer bound by the British mercantile regulations and all American ports were open to trade with all countries except Great Britain. John Adams believed that the April, this April proclamation was America's true declaration of independence, stopping all trade. Adams wrote, quote, the utmost encouragement must be given to trade. And therefore, we must levy no duties at present on exports or imports, nor attempt to combine our trade to our buttons or our seamen. Nice sentiment, not one that American was, America was able to operationalize. Amer Adams and his colleagues drafted a template of national treatment, which was quite audacious at the time. They wanted national treatment in other countries. They were not successful. The cost of the revolution in trade terms was great. Overnight, America lost its privileged access in the markets of the British Empire and the protection of its navy. It was not all so bad to be part of the British Empire. James Madison wrote, the revolution has robbed us of our trade with the West Indies, the only one which, which yielded us a favorable balance without opening any other channels to compensate for it. In every point of view, the trade of this country is in a deplorable state. There's a great book by uh, Douglas Iron called Clashes Over Commerce, where he talks about the history of US trade. And he writes, as students of the enlightenment and opponents of British mercantilism, the founding fathers favored free trade and open commerce among nations and the abolition of all restraints and preferences 
that inhibit a trait. In fact, Thomas Jefferson wrote in 1785, I think all the world would gain by setting commerce at perfect liberty. Our interest would be to throw open doors of, co doors of commerce and to knock off all of its shackles, giving perfect freedom to all persons to the vent of whatever they may choose to bring into our ports and asking the same of theirs. That little coat makes a big difference. For Jefferson, everything was on reciprocity. And that is what led him to actually do the great embargo. Uh, the founding fathers had two exceptions to free trade, defense and reciprocity. At that time, we had Washington and Hamilton on one side, called the Federalists, the later became the Republicans, Jefferson and Madison on the other, called Republicans, the later Democrats, just to confuse things. Hamilton supported helping domestic industries through what he called bounties or subsidies. And he, su he supported tariffs as an important and indis indis indispensable source of revenue. In fact, in his most famous report in 1791, subject of manufacturers, he advised both tariffs for revenue generation and subsidies. Jefferson and Madison were against subsidies and thought them unconstitutional. Both said the way to protect manufacturers is through tariffs. Therefore, Hamilton's report succeeded on the tariff portion, but not on the subsidies portion. Jefferson's trade embargo is important because in December 1807, Jefferson called on Congress to ban all American ships from departing on foreign ports, stop all trade. Now, Jefferson had argued that a trade embargo is better than war. It is a form of peaceful coercion. So aggressive unilateralism is not a new thing in the United States. You can see it as a hallmark of the United States going back to Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson and Madison both believed that the US was in a position to play hardball with Great Britain and enter into commercial warfare. Hamilton and Washington did not because they represented the commercial interests of New York and New England that wanted to maintain friendly relations with Great Britain. The embargo did have a profound effect on the United States. It shifted domestic into domestic production. It changed the landscape as the manufacturers who were open for trade ended up becoming protect protectionists when they became domestic producers and the manufacturers switched behind Jefferson and the Federalists ended up on that side of the importers. Jefferson, who had wanted an agrarian society and wanted the factories to stay in Europe, decided, no, we actually do need to be independent for the factors of life. We must fabricate them ourselves. We now need to have manufacturers as well as the agriculturalists. The first protective tariff of the United States was imposed in 1816 by James Madison, who was uh, at that time Secretary of Treasury. They divided manufacturers into three groups. One, those who were firmly and permanently established. Two, those who were recently and partially established. And third, those whose goods were slightly cultivated but were still dependent on imports. They decided to support the ones that were firmly established and the ones that were almost firmly established, but not the ones that were not established. Um, so as a result, the United States was divided between high tariff groups, those, those parts of the country that want protectionism, which was the mid-Atlantic states, and the low tariff groups, which were the agriculturists. And of course, they actually did we, we still are, are we, we still have, um, uh, you know, uh, slavery in the United States. So it's southern states were export export agreement. How you compromise between the north and south? They had a compromise tariff, not too high, but not high enough to keep out the, keep out enough inexpensive Indian fabrics, but allow imports to uh, for high goods, British goods, um, uh, which were of a different quality. After that, we went to a period of what is known as the Clay American system. Henry Clay, Secretary of State under Jean Quincy Adam, proposed economic nationalism. The sole object of a tariff is to tax foreign industry with a view of promoting and protecting American industry. So now the Northern manufacturers and the Western raw material producers had benefited from the high tariffs, but not the Southern states. So Clay wanted to equalize things and he wanted the South to sell to the North near shoring, old times that, but the market was not big enough to satisfy. He wanted to keep things secular, um, I mean, contained. He was successful in the passing the Tariff Act of 1828, which raised average tariffs 
from 25% to 62%. That's the highest it's ever been in US history. And the money they regenerate, they got from tariffs they used for infrastructure development that further helped the North and further alienated the South. Uh, because the South viewed the import tourist uh, duties as tax on the South for the benefit of the North and the important cause of South's economic problems. This was became known as the tariff of abominations and led South Carolina to issue an, a nullification order, basically saying that the Congress has done things that were unconstitutional. Um, they at, at points they were able to make a compromise and eventually some tariffs would did decline, but we are talking about 18, from 1846 to 1860, uh, you're seeing a boost um, of uh, American exports because Britain repealed its corn laws, made Western farmers achieve, achieve greater access to foreign markets because of dra dramatic decline in transportation costs, uh, repeal of the corn laws, as I said, and the Crimean War that, that um, meant that U.S. grains were needed. Then we have the Civil War. Now, to go through fast, Lincoln was not particularly interested in the topic of trade. But he knew that tariffs needed to generate revenue. Uh, from 1865 to 1912, the Republican coalition maintained high tariff. This is an era where you see the shift from tariff because of revenue generation, paradigm shift is tariff for protection. Now here you see protectionism equal patriotism. Throughout the Southern Democratic were oppos there was opposition to protective tariff, but they were somewhat weakened while Northern Democrats had come to the side of protection. Here, the American Iron and Steel Association became very powerful. The president of American Iron and Steel Association, 1864 said, protection in this country is only another name for patriotism. In those days, protectionism was not a bad word in US politics. Simple truth was that high tariffs and protectionisms always delivered tangible results to specific constituencies who gave political support to the Republicans. Democrats maintained that the taxes were heavy burden on consumers and farmers, but were not well organized. Again, protection and patriotism. Republicans branded all opponents, this is 19th century, all opponents of protective tariffs or advocates of tariff reform as quote unquote free traders, a bad word who represented foreign interests and only wanted to weaken the United States. Anglophobia figured prominently also in the late 19th century US politics. Advocates of tariff reform were smeared as being foreign agents conspiring to open up the US markets on behalf of British monopolies. They were unpatriotic enough to believe in free trade. Republicans also attacked and rejected the theory of comparative advantage. Between 1860 and 1900, we had the average tariff rate that was about 40 to 45 percent, never below 35 percent. There was small democratic intervention with President Cleveland uh, after the Civil War, the first democratic president that tried to sort of lessen the protectionism. The Republican platform, however, was we are uncompromisingly in favor of the American system. I'm telling you this, so you don't think Donald Trump is an anomaly <laughs> of protection. We protest against its destruction as, protest, as, as proposed by President Cleveland and his party. They serve the interest of Europe. We serve the interest of America. Republicans won again in 1888 and kept protectionism intact till 1912. Now, there is a question slightly, do high tariffs help American industrial expansion? That's an open question, not the economist. The Republicans, however, also opened the country to immigration. It's not just products couldn't come in, but people could. Population of the US doubled, railroad was built, and it had enough of natural resources to be exploited. Wages were always high, and it had a pretty legitimate apolitical legal system and judiciary for enforcement of its contracts. Andrew Carnegie had said back then, even if every port of the United States were blockaded today and remained so for 10 days, the people of the United States would suffer only some small inconveniences and disturbances in crisis. Uh, while it was protections at home, they exported its 
export its, uh, its, its exports. Um, interestingly enough, it didn't export much in raw materials. There's a lot of vertical integration, except for cotton. And some have blamed that as, as the reason why that there was not a comparative strength in the textile industry. Both parties became divided, old card Republicans, progressive Republicans, Democrats from the North, Democrats from the South. Ultimately, we are dealing with a time of monopolies. There were only a few handful of com companies that were export-based. U.S. Steel, International Harvester, Standard Oil, Westinghouse, Armour. These companies did not need protective tariffs, but owed their existence to them. We also saw the advent of coalitions interested in exporting, like National Association of Manufacturers, National Reciprocal League. It's at this time that Andrew Carnegie, their arguments started developing against protective tariffs. It's making high cost of living, it's distorting the US economy by promoting monopolies and increasing industrial uh, concentration. Andrew Carnegie is quoted as saying, which enraged Republicans, there is a cult here who regards the doctrine of part protection as sacrosanct and everlasting. None knows better than us, but its members are few and not likely to increase since other countries are admittedly developed and gained. Since, since our country has admittedly developed and gained and is to continue gaining manufacturing supremacy until it reaches a position where free trade in manufacturing will be desirable for all, for, for it, all the markets of the world open to her and hers to the world. Our difficulty will then be to get other nations to agree to free trade. Change only came with this protectionist attitude until Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson had been against high tariffs. He actually had helped create a branch of New York's free trade club in Atlanta and believed that tariffs were simply a way for politicians to dispense the largest of governments for special interests in exchange for political favors. He created the Tariff Commission. Um, and for earliest recommendation of Tariff Com Commission was an unconditional MFN. Unfortunately, World War I <laughs> broke out. And even though there was a decline in tariff, it's not very clear whether the, there was any, you couldn't prove that there, we weren't harmed by imports because Europe was in shambles. Who was importing? We were not importing much from Europe. After the war, <laughs> But it was during Wilson, by the way, that we passed the Revenue Act of 1916 and the 1916 anti-dumping law, which was a criminal statute with criminal punishments, but it was hard to enforce as it had a predatory intent. Um, there was nothing, Wilson said, I'm not interested in economic subjects. There was nothing in the League of Nations about reducing tariffs. Allies were allowed to discriminate against the trade of the de defeated central powers. And the Treaty of Versailles, of course, mandated Germany give preferential access to goods from the Allies. Shortly thereafter, we have Harding, Coolidge, Republicans back in power. We again go back to protectionism here. We have anti-dumping acts amended in 1921 to take out the, uh, the intent requirement and give it to Treasury to actually impose. So anti-dumping law is very sacrosanct in the United States. Um, please note that although it was on the book, it did not become important as much in the 1970s and 80s, but it's historically important. Um, at the same time, so I, I'm gonna go fast because I'm gonna run out of time. Coolidge in 1926, again, our strength of economy is, predict, is predicated on protectionism. Uh, Herbert Hoover, big supporter of protectionism. And of course, we have all heard about the smooth Holly Tariff Act. Uh, now, the smooth Holly Tariff Act was not, it was not a whim, right? Chairman Holly of the House Ways and Means Committee held like 40 days, 43 days of hearings and 18 volumes of testimony. And Senator Smooth of the Senate Finance Committee was known as the most knowledgeable member of Congress on the details of the tariff schedules, but he was also called the Apostle of Protections and the Sugar Senator. He actually called, apparently, 1,000 witnesses to raise tariffs on 177 products. 1,000 plus economists wrote an open letter saying this is a really bad idea. Hoover didn't listen to it, signed it, 200 pages long, raised tariff by 15 percentage point, and this was already on high, on what was already a high tariff. Europe, terribly upset. We are trying to discover, we're trying to recover from war. 
why the United States has refused to join the League of Nations, but also has refused to negotiate international rules for trade, given Hoover's approach. Now here, I want to make a parallel between Herbert Hoover and Donald Trump, because Hoover, first of all, blamed the depression on Europe, not high tariffs. Second, he was a nationalist, and he believed that tariffs are an internal issue that cannot be discussed in an international conference. And he said, US should not surrender our own control of an important part of our domestic affairs to the influence of other nations or alternatively would lead us to the futilities of international negotiations. In other words, protectionism, patriotism, anti-internationalism or international forum. Um, the Great Depression, of course, caused us, and here the paradigm shift does happen with enter FDR, and most importantly, Cordell Hall, the Secretary of State. Hall wanted, was a southerner, he wanted immediate reduction of tariffs. That's not politically possible in the middle of a depression, but he was part of the parties part known as the Wilsonian internationalists. Roosevelt's approach was, let's try to negotiate with each country separately. But the, even the Roosevelt administration was divided between the New Deal nationalists, and I want to draw a parallel to the presence, the people who want to concentrate on what's happening inside the United States, and the Wilsonian internationalists like Hall. Many New Deal policies allowed for import restrictions to ensure higher prices. So Hall's project was a reciprocal trade agreement. And here is where the paradigm shift happened in the United States, trade and peace. Hall wrote in his memoir, when the war came in 1914, I was very soon impressed with two points. I saw that you could not separate the idea of commerce from the very, very idea of war and peace, and that wars often caused by economic rivalry conducted unfairly. Colonial rivalry was real cause of war, the need to secure empire and preferential access to the wars to the world's raw materials. Roosevelt, you know, liked Hall, but felt there was only that much that trade can do. Um, he eventually agreed to go and ask for the trade negotiating authority under reciprocal trade agreements after 1934, which in contrast to the Holly Smooth Act was only three pages long and took like four months to pass. Um, the, this becomes an important issue for, for the United States. RTAA, Congress agreed to give up its ability to legislate duties and specific goods and all that political, what they call law ruling that was happening in the United States. Hall developed a template for the RTAA that was then used for the GATT. If you look at the, uh, the uh, Reciprocal Trade Agreements Act, he talks about MFN, internal taxes, quotas, exchange controls, um, tariff concessions, uh, by 1940, the United States has signed 21 agreements that accounted for 23rd, two thirds of US trade. But Hall always said these trade agreements are not economic. They're only 5% about economic. The rest are political and psychological. Roosevelt was skeptical about its ability to stop war, Hall believed. He said, trade treaties are too goddamn slow. The world is marching too fast. And of course, we know that we had World War II. America had failed in the leadership after World War I, and they did not want to do it again. Paul felt very strongly that they needed to have the institutions in place for a liberal economic order. Maybe Hall believed in a liberal economic order. John Maynard Keynes thought he was a lunatic for wanting to ask for the imperial preferences to be taken away. He actually said, quote, lunatic proposals of Mr. Hall. Um, the Americans seem to believe in an outdated ideology of limited government intervention that ignores the new reality that governments would need extensive trade controls to ensure economic stability. There was a lot of pushback against um, the RTAA, but it kept getting renewed. It helped that Roosevelt was in, was in, was in the White House and then Truman followed. The democratic um, statement was world peace is of transcendent importance and pledged to extend the trade policies of the Roosevelt administration. This is uh, who, um, Truman. The Republicans, extension of world trade is necessary to repair the waste of war and building enduring peace. 
but our primary obligation is to American workers, American farmers, American industry, America first. Push back against RTAA and the shift of paradigms happened. At that point, the official position of labor was to support trade. Now, it was easy for the United States to be supportive because it was the zenith of its power at the end of World War II. World War II. And the move towards a multilateral trading system. We all know the story of the ITO and the Congress refused to accept it. Part of it is because Roosevelt didn't want to use the political capital for the ITO, which he didn't think had, had support from the business sector, but he wanted to make sure that RTAA would get renewed, their, their negotiating authority. In the post war, World War II period, there was a consensus on opening trade because the US economy was flourishing and because of the US zenith and its, in its power, but things changed quickly. E European economic community, US did not want the Europeans to form a separate bloc and have a common agricultural policy. Japan acceded to the GATT in 1955 and was seen as a potential export powerhouse. And we had OPEC was created and the labor movement in the United States started to waver in support of trade. The Republicans supported the trade as, as, as they saw it as an important tool, tool, however, to fight communism. Um, here we see a switch between the Republicans and Democrats switching places as Democrats become anti-trade given their close relationship to labor. Without taking too much time from 19, I would say the United States drops from, nine, from the Trade Extension Act of 62, the Trade Act of 1974 to um, the Omnibus Trade Act of 1988, the U.S. It goes on the, on, the, on the path of administered protections. Administered protectionism means negotiate a multi-fiber agreement, GSP, trade adjustment assist assistance, escape clause, section 201, creation of the ITC, adjusting the anti-dumping laws, and moving the anti-dumping administration from treasury to commerce, which is important, because commerce represents business interests. And Treasury wasn't doing a very good job of it. Voluntary restraints agreement or orderly marketing agreements because the executive would say, negotiate with us because Congress is going to build, be worse for you. Um, there was some area measures of protectionism, but again, we saw, I would say, this is um, in the, by 1978, everything had sort of moved out of the GATT system with Section 301. Um, and there was great fear that, um, as Archer Dunkel said, the multilateral system is seriously endangered. US-Canada FTA was signed. Um, but then we have this period with Clinton and Bush, um, who seemed to be supportive of trade, uh, but we, we had a middle. I would say that we had an unholy alliance between the far left and the far right, but there was a middle that was holding together. Uh, I would say, and I'm sure there are people here who know that it was we the focus was on the exports, opening up of export markets, some protection. I mean, even Ronald Reagan protected the automobile, steel, textile, agriculture. Uh, but Clinton is quoted as saying, I was a free trader at heart. No American president is going to say that. And felt that I had to support Mexico's economic growth to ensure long-term stability in our hemisphere. That's what he said about that. Can you imagine Biden saying that? saying that I am a free trader at heart or anyone in the United States. I remember Charlene Barshevsky saying, yeah, we have to, we have to just give up on the textile thing. I mean, China is gonna exceed. That was just after Chinese succession. A failure of, uh, we started to see the increased fragility of the consensus in US Congress with these bilaterals that uh, Bush too, was trying to negotiate with, uh, we did with South Korea, with Colombia, et cetera. By the time Obama and Hillary were doing their campaign trips, nobody was saying good things about trade. Um, it was all becoming about containing China. And it was really hard to get the new versions of RTAA or Trade Promotion Authority and the Democrats had to rely on Republican votes for them. The Trump administration's America faced I believe going back to Republican rules, use laws that were already on the book in the administrative protectionism, section 201, section 232, section 301, IEPA. It wasn't things that weren't there, but he used them in ways that they hadn't been used before. 
Now we are at Biden administration. Back to free trade is a bad word. It's also protectionism seems to be kind of patriotism in a way. We also have this China problem. And uh, the Biden administration, what um, Ambassador Tai told me personally is, I'm not interested in any trade agreement about market access or non-discrimination. We are thinking about a worker-centered approach to trade. They are not even asking for trade promotion authority because in my humble opinion, they don't know exactly what to ask in their trade promotion authority. What is the worker-centered approach? Now, it is true that the worker has been left behind. We all know that the middle class in developed countries has not, as, has not benefited. Um, we have a bill now, it's called Playing Field 2.0 about, and it's bipartisan win about redoing the, uh, our anti-dumping laws because of the Belt and Road Initiatives, largely because China sets up factories in other places and they subsidize them in, in other countries. And so our anti-dumping, our countervailing duties need to be able to address them. What do I get from this? America has, a strong, has been a strong, Americans have been protectionists. There's a protectionist country. The only time we have been free traders have been two. One, where we have been strong in exports and imports have been weak, and, or international globalists have been in charge. You had Woodrow Wilson, you had Hall, you had Roosevelt, and then you had, you had what was it, the fear of communism. We had this moment of euphoria, seeing the end of the Cold War, where we thought that we could bring China into the fold. It hasn't worked out the way we wanted it to. Our, I think our anti-dumping laws are sacrosanct. So if they were challenged in the WTO, it's not a, not, not a surprise in the, way, in the way the US would react to it. Where does that leave us today? Where is, where is, where is the corridor hall of today? And how are we going to, the, there is nothing in the United, there's nothing that the Biden administration can do on the trade side without its constituencies. And it's it, administrative protectionism continues. Now, I want to make a few statements about China. I don't know how much time I have, but I'll do it very briefly. Um, and these are just general observations. Again, I go back to history. China in the 15th century had the technology that surpassed the West, the West in maritime. The Chinese military had made maritime engineering, and these are things that President Xi talks about, so history brings us. The Chinese military had made maritime engineering a high priority. An emperor had established a permanent navy nearly unheard of in the world. However, it had a low profile when it came to traders. Only between 1405 and 1433 did it flex its muscle due to this Chinese navigator, Xing He. Some have argued that this may have been due to the inferior status according to traders in Confucianism that used merchants as parasites and steered the brightest and the most ambitious away from that into the Mandarin bureaucracy. It was also interesting to me that they didn't see trade as trade. It was tribute, gift. There's a difference. Buyer, seller, tribute, gift. Treasure fleet diplomacy. Xing He died in 1424 during his seventh voyage, and after that, there was no more exploration. The Chinese allowed their naval and merchant fleets to wither, and there was an imperial edict that not to construct any more vessels and they forbid the building of any ocean going vessels. I think China has learned from those lessons. By mid 18th century, the English had developed an increasingly thirst for tea, as we all know. Of course, the Europeans at the same time did um, conquer the seas, but the Chinese wanted very little from the English, as we know, in the words of the 19th century British trade commissioner for China, Robert Hall, the Chinese have the best food in the word world, rice, the best drink, tea, the best clothing, silk, and fur, processing these tables and their innumerable native adjuncts, they do not need to buy a penny's worth elsewhere. The Chinese did buy some copper and mechanical novelties, but not enough. And of course, we know what the British did. The East India Company perfected the technique of growing opium in India and disowning it in China. Um, 
Meanwhile, the British destroyed the Indian textile industry, but that's a different story for a different time. Now, prisoner Xi likes to quote a lot of ancient philosophers and has specifically stated that Han Fei is one of his favorite political thinkers other than he said he's also quoted Mao Zedong, Karl Marx, and Karl Schmitt. Now, who is Han Fei? <clears throat> Traditional concept, Chinese conceptions of law. And again, I apologize, I'm not a Chinese expert, but I find all of this very fascinating and you've given me the podium, so here it goes. Uh, Chinese conceptions of law were influenced by three schools, Confucianism, legalism, and naturalism. Han Fei belonged to the legal legalist schools. And while the Confucianists believed in lead the people with administrative injunctions and keep them orderly with penal law, and they will avoid punishment, but will be without a sense of shame. I find that interesting. The translation in Persian, we have a word for sense of shame. I think Chinese does too. There is no such word in English. It's different than being shamed. There's a sense of shame is different than shame. It's not we call it about face saving face. It's not exactly the same thing. Lead them with excellence, keep them orderly, etc., with ritual property, and they will order themselves. Han Fei disagreed with that. In the Qin Dynasty and during the Warring States period, Han Fei's approach was: human beings are fundamentally selfish, brutish, covetous, Hobbes. Additionally, contrary to Confucian belief, they believe that this situation could not be resolved through self-cultivation or through diligent practice of rituals. Therefore, Fei reasoned that the best way to govern human beings was to control the base nature, depending on the environment of the time. It had harsh, simple, uniform rules, but hierarchical, the Confucianization of the law. Um, today, she talks about the rule of law. He means the legalist rule of law, law as an instrument to maintain social discipline rather than limit the power of the state. Uh, Chinese legal scholar, Jim Horsley uh, talks about uh, a Chinese perception of an administrative state and rule of law are complex and nuanced in a political structure where the party leadership is above everything, including the law. The party maintains a dual state legal system under which the party owns the absolute leadership, but continues to delegate to state legal institution the authority to address day-to-day -day matters. President Xi, uh, CCP, will continue to bypass state legal requirements when dealing with sensitive matters. The political agenda will always trump the business interest of private parties, even when codified into law. President Xi is repeatedly quoted saying the following statement. When those who uphold the law are strong, the state is strong. When they are weak, the state is weak. This is not the rule of law. This is rule by law. It illustrates integration of legalism into the one party framework. Now, if we combine this with the history of trade and the lessons that are learned both from the 15th century and the 18th and 19th century, and most importantly, the lesson learned, I learned this because of the Iranian revolution. You cannot have half-baked reforms. That's a recipe for revolution. When you start reforms, you better be successful or you will be, <laughs> Gorbachev learned it. The Ottoman Empire learned it when it tried to pass the Ottoman Civil Code. The Qin Dynasty learned it too late. Communist Party and is not going to do it. I think President Xi believes too much reform will undermine, has learned the lesson from history. We are going back. So we are now, I mean, this is where I'm ending. We are in this space where we're both going back, a protectionist United States with a long protectionist history. And really, international globalists are very few. The president of Interna Inter IIE, Inter Institute of International Education, likes to tell me only 30% of Americans have a passport. Out of those 30%, half of them have a passport to go on a cruise with other Americans. So that means 15% of Americans have a passport. Globalists, internationalism is a bad word in very many quarters. We are totally, I am very sensitive to this because the Iranian revolution happened and I'm, I'm a child of the revolution. So I always think that I lived in a bubble. We live in a bubble, us, the internationalists in, in the United States. That's not the majority of our country. It's my country, I love it, but it's not the majority of the country. And that's the, that's the vote. 50 million people voted for Donald Trump. 
That's no joke. On the other hand, you have China who understands and a government that understands reform means their end. So there's no reform. And they've learned from history, they're not gonna give up the waters. They already did that and look what happened to them. And he, he keeps, she, President Xi talked about history. So where does that live? The multilateral trading system. I just wrote a paper for the Baker Institute that talked about the WTO should become a, a forum for regulatory cooperation, transparency, and open multilateral agreements. Let's find narrow things we can agree on and be a place for regulators as well as trade negotiators. Because trade negotiators and regulators have different mindsets. And what about the rest of the world? We are here in Colombia. And most recently, a former Chinese trade official told me, no, I would say government official, who happens to be involved in trade. If you are not at the table, you are on the menu. Thank you. We hope you have enjoyed today's panels and roundtables. Now, we respectfully invite you to the reception sponsored by the law firm Pose Herrera Ruiz, which will, take, which will take place on the first floor of this building in front of the library. Thank you again for your attention and your time. Have a great reception. Thank you.